All right, everyone, we are continuing with our story on Christopher Columbus. This is the second part of that. And right now we are in the middle of his second voyage. And Columbus is just getting back from Cuba, uh, where he tried uh, within his second voyage to see if he could push even further west. And he, he comes back and he gets to uh, the settlement uh, at La Isabella, which is on the northern coast of the Dominican Republic. And he's in terrible shape. He He had nearly died on this journey. And to make matters worse, and this is very important, um, when he was gone, Margaret, uh, who had, you know, six months before, he had given him 400 soldiers to go and kind of explore inland. Well, he went around stealing and abusing natives and doing all sorts of terrible things. And he turned Columbus orders to explore the islands, basically into a license for him and his men to go plundering uh, kind of for their own personal benefit. Uh, Columbus' brother Diego and the others that were left in charge kind of rebuked him, and they told him that he needed to follow the orders given by Columbus to treat the natives fairly. But Marguerite uh, didn't take that well, and he joined a group of dissenters uh, to form a mutiny. And the mutineers commandeered three ships, and they headed back to Spain shortly before Columbus had gotten back. So Columbus comes back, and he's basically left to pick up the pieces of this mess. Um, he returns not only with his health in the just awful. Um, he, he was basically barely even functional. Um, but also now the natives were, were nearing revolt uh, because of what Margaret had done. And the Spaniards too were still all pissed off. And it just, it was a bad situation. Uh, the, the enterprise was really probably on the verge of total collapse. Um, that is until Columbus younger brother, his name was Bartholomew stepped in. So shortly before Columbus got back in September, his younger brother Bartholomew had arrived, and Bartholomew was likely Columbus' closest friend. He was he was a true believer in Columbus's vision, and uh, had been seeking out funding from other kingdoms when Columbus had set sail on his first voyage. But now he had kind of caught up with him on on the second voyage. He found that you know there's all this chaos when he arrives, and you know he was happy to see his brother, but he was also obviously really concerned. Um, when he got out there, because uh, his now famous brother is terribly ill, things are kind of crazy, and he he kind of steps in to, to clean up the chaos that had broken out while, while Columbus had been away exploring southern Cuba. Now, Bartholomew was a, essentially became like the de facto governor throughout the fall and winter of 1494 and 95. Uh, as, as Columbus was slowly regaining his health, uh, he was given the governing title El Adelantado, kind of like the leader. And uh, unlike Columbus, who was known for kindness and patience and kind of being pretty easy going with people, Bartholomew had the temperament of, uh, you know, what you might think of like a stern school principal. And he began to enforce a bunch of strict measures on both the Spaniards and the natives in order to restore order to things. Neither side liked this imposition. Uh, complaints about... The state of things on the island also must have been reaching the king and queen of Spain that summer. In the fall of 1494, they sent a letter requesting that Columbus return, if possible, to give an accounting of what was going on. Because, you know, they're getting these people that are going back. Uh, Margaret had just got back with a bunch of people, and these people are kind of complaining. However, Columbus is obviously he's in really poor health that fall, um, and the chaos uh, in the settlement is going on, and he doesn't really have any gold to show for all the work that he's been doing. And uh, so he didn't go back, but he all of a sudden now he feels more pressure than ever to, you know, deliver to the king and queen because he, he's worried that they're they're losing faith in him and that they might pull their backing and destroy the whole the whole thing. It might all been for nothing. Um illness at this time was another major problem both for the Spanish and the natives. But the fate of the natives was obviously far worse. Uh, uh, Essentially, a pandemic had broken out uh, among the natives due to the new illnesses that were brought by the Europeans, and they began to die in large numbers. Also, um, food supplies from Spain were running low, and the desperate Spaniards would go out and pillage native villages for food. The situation in the settlement, um, which was on northern Dominican Republic, uh, in the fall and winter of 1495 was terrible. It was awful. Columbus slowly came back to health uh, from the brink of death. Uh, and chaos just kind of seemed to be the order of the day. And by the spring, things were really reaching kind of a, a fevered pitch. What happened in the spring was that the pressure to produce uh, gold had really gotten to Columbus. And so he devised a plan to 
send back all these captured captured Caribs uh, and the other natives who had been fighting against the Spanish to send them back to the king and queen as slaves. He did this and he kind of naively thought that the king and queen would be pleased by this because he thought he'd send them back and the, you know they would become civilized through through being in Spain as slaves and then they could get you know taught Christianity and that would save their souls they'd get baptized and in in Spain during the time of Christopher Columbus Isabella uh and and, and in some other areas as well Christians could not be slaves. So the idea was send them back, reform them, get them baptized, and then they could be made free citizens. Uh, and it would save their souls from hell. So Columbus kind of thinks, hey, you know, I can't send back gold, but I could send back these, these tribal uh, warriors and people who've been fighting against us and the cannibals. I can send them back and they can be reformed. Uh, and the queen should be happy about that. So he sends back almost 500 native prisoners of war uh, who have been fighting against the Spanish and who have, you know, and, and the Caribs and things that they had encountered. And the problem is almost half of them die on the voyage home, probably due to the illnesses that they had no immunity to. So the king and queen become really concerned here. All of a sudden, this boat shows up and there's all these dead natives that had died on, en route. And the queen is like, what the heck is going on? And, uh, you know, she's just not happy with what's going on. So by March, uh, late spring or kind of mid spring, I guess, um, the chiefs had had enough of the Spanish running amok in their territory. Several chiefs led by a guy named Caunabo banded together in an alliance against the Spaniards. Now, ever since the Spaniards had arrived, there was always a fraction of the natives who would kill Spaniards when they had the chance. But this group you know, its ranks were growing because the Spaniards were becoming less and less popular, mainly because of what Marguerite had done with his, you know, 500 soldiers that went around for six months abusing natives uh, and doing all this other terrible stuff. However, this feeling was not universal. Uh, Guacanagri, the chief that was originally friends with Columbus and remained friends with him, was probably more aware than any of the other native chiefs that the Spanish were vastly more powerful than the natives in this kind of an emerging new world order. And so he decided to ally himself with Columbus. He must have realized that by doing so, he could advance his own position over his native rivals. And he, he trusted that Columbus had good intentions due to his personal friendship with Columbus. Guacanagri was likely the only, uh, was likely the only native chief who had had a significant personal association with Columbus at that time. So by the end of March, the alliance of these native tribes who wanted to expel the Spaniards uh, kind of reached a sufficient numbers that they formed this huge band of warriors, perhaps thousands and thousands of warriors. And they were intent on completely exterminating the Spaniards from the islands. And, uh, you know, they basically wanted to do to them what they had done to the 40 men who were left behind on the first voyage. So Columbus at this time, he assembles what is sort of a ragtag army. The The Spaniards are not in good shape at this time. And he also had native allies with him, uh, uh, Guacanagri and his warriors. And there were a couple hundred Spaniards, but they were suffering from poor health, lack of food. It wasn't, you know, great. On the other hand, Columbus knew that the army he faced was headed by the chief who had killed all the men on his first voyage, including some of his relatives. But you know, they were significantly outnumbered and Columbus was not crazy confident that they were going to be victorious. So now it should also be kept in mind that the Spaniards had been fighting the Muslim armies for centuries at this point, and they were skilled warriors with superior technology, including primitive muskets. So what they did is they surprised the native band of warriors on the battlefield when they they started to to approach them. They, they went out to meet this large warrior band and what they did was they basically rode in on the sides with horses and they set loose a bunch of these these large war dogs that the Spaniards have on the, the natives. And the Spanish horsemen were in armor and they were nearly immune from the weak native kind of wooden spears that they were throwing at them. And the natives realized with this inability to harm the men on horseback and the sound and smell of muskets and the sight of these terrible dogs... Uh, you know, these are the horses. They, they'd never even seen horses before, and it caused the natives to panic. They broke ranks and they began to flee. And this large native band of warriors routed and they all are running away and they were killed and captured. And 
afterwards, Kaunabo, the leader of that that uprising, he he had escaped. So Columbus felt this victory was, you know, a miracle because he he knew that they were way outnumbered, uh, and he saw it as evidence from God that you know God's on our side. So he soon got word that Kaunabo had fled into the mountains, and he sent uh, his his young zealous officer that he he really seemed to like, uh, Alonso de Ojeda, who's kind of this twenty nine year old, you know, impetuous uh, fighter guy, uh, conquistador, and he's to take a small band of warriors, uh, you know, the best ones to find Kaunabo and capture him by whatever means they need to. And Ojeda eventually found Kaunabo. And what he did is he went up and basically lied to him. And he said, uh, you know, we want to we wanna make a peace with you. Why don't you come with us? And, uh, you know, you come back with us. And what he asked the chief to do is to come back to discuss the terms of the peace. And the chief actually agreed, but only if he could bring his guards with him. And Ojeda was like, okay, sounds good. So on their way back, Ojeda sets a trap. He he convinced Kaunabo to put on handcuffs by saying that they were a fashion accessory of kings in Spain and look how cool these are. And so he puts them on. And basically that was the signal. As soon as he got the cuffs on Kaunabo, his men, you know, pulled out their weapons and and basically uh held up all the guards. Uh, Ojeda throws Kaunabo onto the back of a horse and they ride off uh to take him back to to Columbus. And uh so Ojeda arrives at the uh, settlement with this chief as his prisoner. But interestingly, Columbus doesn't have the chief executed. Uh, he, even when Kaunabo confessed to killing Columbus's men that were left behind at the end of his first voyage, Columbus decided that it was such an important chief, this guy was kind of a big deal, that he should be sent back to Spain and his fate should be decided by the Spanish authorities. Columbus even described Kaunabo as knowledgeable, sharp-witted, and courageous, and he, he ended up, while he was in prison, going and talking with this chief and had multiple discussions surrounding the nature of their beliefs about the afterlife. It was, it was interesting to see the way Columbus viewed Kaunabo after he had captured him. So the battle with the natives, this this large battle in the spring of 1495, it really broke the native spirit of rebellion that they had. And it also kind of solidified to all the natives that, hey, the Spaniards are the new authority in the region and you better comply with them. The tribes that rebelled were defeated in battle. These prisoners were taken back as slaves uh, per standard kind of feudal policy of what you do with the people that you uh, that, that fought against you when you capture them and they're prisoners of war. So Columbus decides to turn and really focus on making this region profitable for the crown. So he instituted a typical feudal age taxation, uh, taxation system in which tribute was to be paid quarterly by the vassals to of the crown or face punishment. You know, you, you take over people, you're like, all right, you guys have to pay us back now, and you guys are required to pay X amount every three months. Now, here's where Columbus made a, a terrible mistake, honestly. Uh, it, it cost a lot of lives. Uh, Columbus thought gold was super abundant. He just, he, he saw these little gold trinkets that they had, and he thinks that they were, there's gold all over the place, when in reality, these were likely, you know, family heirlooms that took generations to acquire. So, he had this ignorance and his false beliefs that they were near Asia and there was gold, you know, there's gold all over the place. You just had to find it. And he made it a requirement that they bring what essentially was like a tablespoon of gold dust or gold every three months, which was a fatal miscalculation and, and way too much. The natives, you know, they were under fear of penalty uh, from these new rulers. You know, they began to dedicate themselves to finding gold. They, they knew, okay, this is what we got to do. And, they did so with such, you know, intensity and, and such focus that they neglected important things like tending to crops. And they were, you know, essentially, they were supposed to be the new vassals of the Spanish crown, um, serfs, just like the serfs in Spain, but they were essentially reduced to slavery that summer after being defeated in battle because of the extreme taxation burden that was put on them. And to make matters work, sickness from the Spaniards was spreading and decimating these native villages. It was an awful situation, truly horrible. And the natives were desperate, and many of them you know, fled to the mountains, and others even committed suicide. Now, likely around 
the time of this first tribute was due. This is in the late summer after three months of this. Columbus realized that almost none of the natives were actually able to produce the gold that he required. And he realized that he had made a miscalculation. But still wrongly thinking that gold was abundant, he, he, he kept the gold tribute, but he cut it in half. He said they only had to bring half of that amount. And he also said, all right, look, if you can't find gold, then you need to bring, I think it was like 20 pounds of spun cotton. So they'd need to give a lot of cotton to them that was that was ready to go as an alternative to the tribute payment. And while this was definitely more manageable, though it still was obviously unfair uh, as a burden on the natives, the damage was largely already done. The The diseases were spreading. The disarray was caused by the tribute. The, the harvest was poor. There was a famine in the fall. And the desperate plight of the natives became an absolute unmitigated disaster. Now, during the summer and fall of 1495, uh, Columbus was largely busy with his own uh, issues while these terrible policies kind of were wreaking havoc in the background amongst the natives. He, he originally intended to go back with uh, back to Spain in the summer of 1495, but a hurricane hit and it sunk pretty much all the ships that were you know that he was going to be able to take, and the ones that were left needed to be repaired, and it was, it was a big big mess. So Columbus was becoming more and more worried about his reputation in Spain, but he couldn't get back to Spain because of the ships being in such bad shape. And his fear about the king and queen being, you know, turning against him were all but confirmed when a guy named Juan Aguado arrived in the fall of 1495, and he conducted a formal investigation on how things were going in the settlement on behalf of the king and queen. And and his timing could not have been worse. The famine that had struck the natives was also causing the available food for the Spanish to run low as they relied on food that the natives provided. Hunger was a major problem, and you know, people were just pissed off at, at Columbus and his brother. So Aguado found plenty of people willing to complain about the Columbus brothers, and Columbus knew he had to go back as soon as possible to try and salvage, salvage you know, the patronage that he was getting from the king and queen. But it was clear with so many nav- uh, natives having abandoned the area and starvation breaking out and very little gold produced, it was, at this point, it, it appeared to Columbus that his settlement was failing. So before Columbus left, he and his brother scouted out a new location on the southern end of the island that was eventually named Santo Domingo, which actually is the today the capital of the Dominican Republic. It's on the southern end of the Dominican Republic on the island. So that becomes the new center. And they decide that, that you know, he, he kind of says, Bartholomew, while I leave, you're tasked with establishing this new settlement at Santo Domingo and Isabella is essentially going to be abandoned, this settlement up on the northern coast of, of the island. And so eventually Columbus does rep- depart in March of 1496. So almost like eight months after he wanted to leave, but the, the ships got messed up. It took almost eight months until they had them repaired sufficiently uh, to the point that he could make a voyage back to Spain. But this was a horrible voyage back to Spain. Um, there was, uh, you know, there, there was major problems on this journey home. By the time Columbus had left uh, the settlement, Isabella is being abandoned. Starvation's a problem. Very little gold has been acquired. The ships are packed with Spaniards that want to go home. Okay, so and in addition to this, there were thirty natives on board, including Caunabo, who who you know Columbus had developed their respect for. Now, as they're going back, these super crowded ships, they're crowded with all these Spaniards who want to go home that are half starved. And the uh, they start running out of food. And and I'm gonna read what uh what what had happened uh is that it says in the in the journal of of uh, I think it was Ferdinand Columbus who talked about this. He said they uh, yeah, Ferdinand Columbus had, had talked about this, what had happened on this return voyage. He said, they were so near starvation that some of them wished to imitate the Caribs and eat the Indians they had on board. Others, in order to economize the little food they had, were in favor of throwing the Indians overboard, which they would have done if the Admiral, Columbus, had not taken strict measures to prevent them. For he considered the natives as their kindred and fellow Christians and held that they should be no worse treated than anyone else which I found to be very interesting. So finally, the ships all but were running out of food and they sight land and, you know, at this point, they had made it home. 
So with his second voyage concluded, Columbus arrives in Spain uh, in March of 1496, and he was happy to find once he, he he got a chance to talk to the king and queen that they they didn't necessarily believe all the negative reports about him and and they had expressed that they you know they still had confidence in him uh, but he actually had a really hard time getting an audience with the king and queen to discuss the islands to be honest the the novelty you know this is the, the islands were discovered four years earlier the novelty of it all kind of was wearing off uh, and the, there were rumors that the whole endeavor was overhyped. And so kind of the the big crazy discovery and all the gold and everything, it kind of was not the, – the public didn't feel like this was all it was cracked up to be. There was there was some of that going on. But, you know, other nations weren't so quick to to think that. Other nations such as Portugal and England were aggressively looking into making their own claims – you know, in the new world. And in particular, Portugal and Spain were working out with the Pope to come up with a line of demarcation that would basically decide which of the discovered territories would belong to Portugal and which of the discovered territories would belong to Spain. Regardless, the king and queen are super busy and literally for almost a year, Columbus is delayed in getting back to the the colony or, or even longer than that. But, but his initial delay is about a year. Uh, and, that is finally when he gets the authorization to go back to the islands. But it takes almost another year until he's actually able to, able to do it. Uh, now, on the original voyage, or the, the second voyage here that he had just gotten back from, his orders were essentially to set up a trading post. But on this next voyage, what they wanted to, to do was to establish a long-term, like, permanent settlement. Uh, and in this colony, the Spaniards would be given territory from the government and act as local lords that were appointed by the crown to manage kind of the feudal economy and the vassals, the natives, in those territories. This system was known as the encomienda system. It was a bad thing. It was a system that the Spanish had been using previously in their conquest against the Muslims. However, with these orders and the plan set for the journey, delays continued to plague the, the kickoff of this third voyage. Uh, with the king and queen, they were occupied with all these other matters of state, and the funding got delayed. And then, you know, between his return from the second voyage until he took off on his third voyage, Columbus was stuck in Spain for two full years. Uh, and he was had no idea what was going on with his brother back in the settlement at Santo Domingo. Uh, and so... One of the big things of this voyage was that they were going to go farther south on their return voyage into unexplored seas. The hope was that he could find the elusive Asian mainland by exploring further south than they had. So they were going to cross the ocean on a farther south route. Um, and this would uh, help him to find the... Asian mainland, hopefully, he thought. But for the king and queen, they wanted to know what else was around so that as they were negotiating where to draw this line of demarcation with the Portuguese, that they would know, you know, what was there. They didn't want to draw the line without knowing what was down there. So Columbus was to go and try and find the Asian mainland and also basically just to explore to the south and see what he could find. And so he does this. He he sets a course that's much farther south. He splits up his fleet into two groups. He sends one of them. He says, hey, you guys got supplies. Go straight back to the colony. I'm going to take some of my ships. Um, I think it was like three. Uh, it might have been more. And they, they divide up and he goes further south and the other ones go basically straight for the colony. Now, one thing he found out in going further south closer to the equator is he experienced something that sailors find there and it's called the doldrums so for eight days he gets into this area where there's no wind called the doldrums and there's just this unrelenting sun beating down on him and his crew so they're out there in the ocean they're trying to get across and they're stuck and they suffer immensely in this heat and you know for like eight days but finally a, a cool breeze does come up and you, know, you can just imagine how excited they all were when that happened and water's rushing underneath their 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 boat and they're heading towards uh basically farther east and unexplored seas they didn't they didn't know what was there and they kept going and suddenly on the horizon the island of trinidad was spotted off uh, and this is just off the coast of uh, venezuela 
Their third crossing had been successful, and once again, Columbus was pressing into lands that had never been seen by anyone in the Old World. Now, Trinidad, as I mentioned, sits just off the coast of Venezuela at the northeast end of the South American continent, and Columbus had no idea that he had just discovered the South American mainland. He thought it was just another large island. However, while he was exploring the gulf on the other side of, of Trinidad, called the Gulf of Paria, um, he found natives, and these natives were you know, friendly, and they also seemed to have an abundance of pearls, which he believed that could be used in future you know, return voyages, and they could send pearls back to, to Spain, so he was excited about that. But uh, problematically, he, he, Columbus's native godson, Diego, found that he couldn't speak with these natives. They spoke a different language. And so, as was his custom in a new area where they couldn't speak the language, he took some natives by force to act as interpreters, guides, and diplomats, brought them on, treated them well, gave them gifts, and promised to return them unharmed if, if they would cooperate. And in the coming weeks, while he was pushing along what is now the northeast coast of Venezuela, he notices these massive rivers that are coming out to the ocean. And he realized that such massive rivers can't come from an island. And it suddenly dawns on him that he may have found a continent, like an entirely unexplored world. He, he didn't call it the new world. He called it the other world. However, he still thought he was very close to China. And he was trying to make sense of all this. And it was totally unexpected that he'd find this far south in this area uh, a continent. And he postulates that this new continent is to the south and east of Asia, kind of where we might think New Zealand or the Philippines are located. And due to his sort of biblical understanding of the geography of the world, he began to think that he had arrived in the mythical terrestrial paradise, which was where they believed that the Garden of Eden was located. And so he marvels at the implications of this discovery and he wanted to explore more, but he also knew he had to get back to his brother in the colony uh, with the supplies before they went bad. And so he he turns up north and he and he heads back to to his brother at the colony. And it, it was another act of pretty incredible navigational skill. He was in uncharted waters, and he makes an almost perfectly direct course from the northern coast of South America to Hispaniola uh, and the colony there, which is modern Haiti and Dominican Republic. And and he makes it to the settlement of Santo Domingo, and there he's you know re reunited with his brother. Uh, they hadn't seen each other in over two years, and they had a lot to discuss. So while Columbus had been gone, a prominent settler named Francisco Roldan, he fomented a full-scale rebellion against uh, Columbus's brother Bartholomew and the others that were loyal to Columbus. And he and his band of rebels had rejected the authority of the Genoese Columbus brothers. And he said, we're only loyal to the Spanish crown. And to complicate matters, the ships that Columbus had sent directly to the island, they, they actually had gotten lost. So when Columbus arrives, those ships actually had just barely arrived just before him, but they arrived on the side of the island, on the other side of the island. And when they did, they ran into Roldan's rebels. And these rebels were able to basically convince the people on the ship to to join them and to become loyal to them. Um, and, you know, the rebels were, they convinced most of the crew to do this and to turn on the Columbus brothers. And they did this by promising them women, gold, and freedom. They basically like, look, these Columbus brothers don't let us go out and do what we want. And if you join us, you're going to be able to do what you want. And so, you know, these sailors and adventurers were kind of like, okay, sounds good. And... Columbus is in an extremely bad situation when he, he, he gets there. This was not a small rebellion. There was a legitimate concern if he was even going to be able to hold on to control of the colony. It, it, it seems as though, by my study of it, that Roldan actually had more popular support. But Columbus had the authority of the crown. And so there's sort of this, this dynamic that begins to play out. Now, Columbus works for months to try and regain control. His strategy to regain control is basically to try and rid himself of his rebels. Like, get these guys out of here. Let them go back to Spain. And he grants them passage to Spain without any charges against them for the rebellion. Uh, and, and it says, look, you guys can even take along your possessions, the gold, the slaves you've acquired. Just just get out of here, basically. But the natives kind of, or not the natives, the, these rebels, they were emboldened by this. 
they saw his appeasement and they began to push even harder. And they demand not only to go home with all their possessions, but also to receive letters of good conduct and so that no future accusations can kind of ever be made against them. Knowing that Columbus does not have enough you know, loyal to him to force a better deal, by late fall, Columbus himself relents. He, he realizes he has to agree to the, the demands of Roldan and his rebels. And they begin to make preparations for getting these rebels back to Spain. So, um, so... Columbus is busy with this negotiation with the Spain. They kind of are like, all right, they will, you know, we'll give you guys letters of good conduct. We'll let you guys keep all your stuff. You guys can go back to Spain. Now, in addition to negotiating with the rebels, Columbus begins to implement the permanent settlement plans uh, that the king and queen had ordered. This encomienda system was not out of the ordinary for the feudal world. It had been the standard policy of Spain during its conquest of the Muslim territories in the preceding century. The system granted a, a Spanish aristocrat a particular area of land over which they would serve as sort of an underlord uh, to, the, to the Spanish king and queen, and they would be tasked with managing the vassals and the ac- economic output of the region and pay tribute to the crown out of uh, you know these regions that they were over. And much like other feudal systems, the people who lived on the lands were subjects of the crown. They weren't slaves, but they were they were serfs. This was a serf system, just like what was found in most of feudal Europe. Now, these subjects would be expected to pay tribute to their local overlord, who is to provide protection and administer justice. And as was customary in feudal systems involving conquered territories, existing local chiefs or leaders would often be recruited to assist the local magistrates and thus retain some level of prestige in the new system. So basically these local chiefs, they kind of go along with this encomienda system because the the local lord comes in, the, the Spaniard comes in and says, look, we can either kill you guys, enslave you guys, or you can be my lieutenant. You can be one of the people who helps me make sure this whole thing runs good. And so they kind of tap into the existing power dynamics to, to, to gain control over an area. Um, with obviously these local leaders wanting to be able to retain some kind of power, these, uh, these local chieftains. Sadly, this system, regardless of how the monarchs thought it would work, essentially turned into the native people being turned into slaves for for Spanish exploitation. It was an absolute disaster. The natives continued to suffer illness and oppression, and it was it was horrible. Okay, there's no way around that. Now, meanwhile, Columbus was focused on trying to rid himself of the rebels and retain control of the enterprise. Um, and by spring of 1499, after various delays, the time for the rebels to leave had arrived. But they sensed that Columbus didn't have the ability or will to push back against their demands. So they refused to leave. And the rebels begin making all these excuses about how the boats aren't seaworthy and other things. And then they start saying, you know, we, we want to make some other demands, right? And, and they even get some of the local tribes to join with them. Uh, by making promises, you know, false promises of freedom if they if they join with them and rolled on, and that all turned out to be a, a big lie, and they, they enslaved them and did horrible things to them. But anyway, by the time the hot, rainy summer season hits, Columbus feels like he's on the verge of losing control again. But in order to retain it, he he basically is forced to grant essentially everything rolled on wants. He allows the rebels to retain the land that they had, their slaves, their pay. He gives them letters of good conduct back to Spain if they want to go. But probably most humiliating of all, Columbus actually consents to giving Roldan the ability to punish Columbus physically if he breaks any of his uh, promises. And and Roldan essentially becomes kind of an equal to Columbus. Uh, And that was the way Columbus was able to achieve peace, but he really was not in full control. Uh, th- there was just too much pushback against him trying to control uh, the Spaniards. Still, many of these rebels no longer are interested in remaining on the island. Uh, and that fall, many of the rebels leave, and they actually took with them 600 of their slaves with them when they went back to to um, to Spain. However, at this time, because of this negotiation with Roldan and kind of basically granting him power alongside of Columbus there was some level of peace that was finally being able to be enjoyed. And, uh, but just as this happens, Alonso de Ojeda, that young kind of captain, he, he had gone back to Spain. Well, all of a sudden he shows up, uh, leading a small group of ships from Spain. And Columbus is like, wait, what? And he explained that he basically had been along the South American mainland as well. 
what what's apparent is that he had found out about Columbus's route from the previous year, and he had convinced the king and queen to let him conduct an exploration expedition. And Columbus, at this point, feels totally betrayed. Uh, in his written agreement with the king and queen, he was only supposed to be allowed to authorize voyages of exploration. This was kind of his thing. He didn't want someone else going out and making these discoveries and claiming all the credit for basically the work that he had done. So Columbus now faced the prospect of other people reaching Asia and the Great Khan first and interfering with all of his plans and vision. And, you know, that was the way he had negotiated the deal with the sovereigns in the beginning. Now, Ojeda is bothered by Columbus's reaction. Uh, and he kind of thinks, you know, Columbus isn't going to be the leader for very long because he believed that the queen was very sick and close to dying. Uh, that was what he had heard. And so he knew that without the queen to back Columbus, there, you know, he, he's not going to be governor for long. And Ojeda kind of begins to stir up another rebellion to kind of position himself to be the one to take over if Columbus is removed from power. Um, Ojeda finds many of People are many people who actually want to go along with his rebellion among many of Roldan's former supporters. Apparently, many of them were upset that Roldan had made peace with Columbus and they saw Ojeda as the more likely person to take over at some point. So they, they kind of joined with him. And Ojeda also realized that Roldan was likely going to be standing in his way if he ever wanted to assume total control over the island. And Ojeda attempts to kill Roldan, but he was unsuccessful. Columbus and Roldan decide to set aside their differences and they go after Ojeda. And basically all through that fall and winter, they're, they're going after Ojeda and Ojeda finally is forced to flee along with a bunch of the rebels that were with him. And again, relative stability prevails during the spring and summer. But again, Columbus is, uh, is very, you know, doesn't have full control as, as he uh, is there. And the encomienda system is continuing to be implemented and, and gold operations actually begin to, to turn a profit. They begin to actually pull out gold through these encomienda uh, system that they're putting in place. But but it's it's kind of too late. With the return of so many of these former rebels going back to Spain and badmouthing Columbus, the king and queen are kind of like, okay, we, we've sent it back again. There's still a ton of people coming back complaining about him. What is going on? So they get this guy named Francisco, or, uh, Francisco de Bobadilla. And Bobadilla was a knight uh, and kind of a power-hungry jerk, <laughs> to put it to put it uh, easily. He, the king and queen say, look, we're going to, you go over there, Bobadilla, and here's what you're going to do. If you find that things aren't being run well, you can take over. So the king and queen apparently naively gave him this authority to take over for Columbus if he felt things were being mismanaged without realizing that maybe Bobadilla would just take advantage of that authority uh, for his own personal gain. And so when Bobadilla arrives in the colony, he, he sails in. And when he arrives there, he actually finds two Spaniards in the gallows that had been hung because they'd been abusing natives and Columbus had them punished for it. And, you know, he was outraged by this. He's like, you know, we got Spaniards being punished by a Genoese for alleged crimes against natives. And he knew that you know, he he knew now knew he had his excuse to take over power from Columbus, and he he found a willing cadre of disgruntled settlers who were willing to blame all of their troubles on Columbus. They made up all sorts of lies and exaggerations in order to get rid of uh, Columbus and his brothers, and uh, you know they'd been had these strict measures on them, and so they're like they they're so hard on us, and it's so terrible, and they do all these terrible things, and so he ends up getting all sorts of false testimony and, and exaggerated claims against Columbus. Uh, and he gets them all written down. Uh, in fact, a lot of the things you'll see today that attack Columbus are from these affidavits and these testimonials that were collected by Bobadilla, who who uh, wanted to take over from Columbus and used these uh, affidavits and and testimonies to to solidify that. So once he has all these, he has Columbus put in chains. He just sends for him. He never even talked to him, never told him what he's being charged with. He just arrests him, puts him in chains and says, all right, you're being shipped back to Spain. Uh, and and when he takes over, he basically tells all the colonists to do whatever the heck they want. He says, get whatever you can out of this island and the natives. Because um, he didn't really think that this was going to last much longer. He thought the queen's support was going to be pulled or that she was going to die. And so he just like, look, guys, while you're here, get what you can. And, and you know, this is probably going to get shut down. Columbus is utterly humiliated 
the injustice of it was clear to many. Even the 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 captain that he was that was captaining the boat that was taking him back to Spain, you know, as soon as they left port, he offers to let Columbus take off his chains and come out from below decks for the remaining voyages. But Columbus actually refused. Columbus wanted to make the point that he'll do whatever the king and queen want. And ultimately, his arrest was done under their authority. So he rides back to Spain in chains. Um, and he actually, interestingly enough, he kept those chains for the rest of his life as a memento to how unfairly he was treated on this voyage. So Columbus ends up being sent back to Spain in chains. So Columbus gets back from his third voyage like a criminal in chains. And people were shocked to see Columbus brought so low. You know, less than a decade earlier, he was paraded around Spain as the hero of exploration. Uh, but luckily, as soon as he got his chance to speak with the king and queen, they realized that a major mistake had been made. Um, they believed Columbus when he explained what had really happened during his third voyage. And he was immediately set free and promised restoration. However, the king and queen likely were still very concerned about how poorly things had went with him running the colony. And it seems like they decided to remove him from political affairs from there on out. And they, they just wanted to focus him on what he was best at, which was exploration. And so what they did was they, they, they sent out a new governor named Nicholas de Ovando, uh, who you'll want to keep in mind, who was the new governor that was going to go and take over for Bobadilla, who had kind of ousted Columbus unfairly. And Columbus, he was super excited about, um, you know, being free of his chains and that the king and queen, you know, believed him. But he was kind of concerned about the crown giving him back all of his authority and privileges and his titles and everything. It seems clear that Ferdinand and Isabella were in a bit of a predicament, okay? They had originally thought that Columbus might find some small islands, you know, like the Canaries, uh, and, and set up a trading post with Asia. Um, and in return, he would be entitled to some portion of the proceeds. However, the crown now is realizing that they had stumbled onto an entirely new continent. Um, I mean, this was massive potential. And giving such a significant share of this huge resource to Columbus probably didn't really seem reasonable to Ferdinand, uh, especially as it would have turned him, you know, Columbus and his heirs into significant geopolitical players. They would have been like governors of this massive territory. So while they did restore many of Columbus's privileges, Full restoration was not forthcoming. Um, nevertheless, and perhaps to, and I actually think probably to placate Columbus, they decided to send him out on another voyage. On one hand, this would help kind of restore Columbus's sense of dignity and honor, but more importantly, it also would help them to explore even farther to the West. The hope was that he would be able to find the Asian uh, mainland and perhaps go even farther and, and, and potentially circumnavigate the entire globe. Uh, so Columbus jumped at this renewed chance to bring about his vision and restore his honor. So with, you know, renewed eagerness, he goes out there and begins hand selecting a crew for his fourth voyage. He even included his son, Ferdinand, who had just turned 12 and was old enough to go out with his father. And Columbus, you know, he felt rejuvenated at this point. He has this chance to get back out to sea, to do what he loves most, which is explore and sail. He has his brother with him, his son, and he gets to kind of choose his most trusted associates to go with him on this, on this voyage. And it, it ends up, honestly, his fourth voyage ends up being the most incredible nautical adventure of all of his voyages. It's actually, it's actually pretty amazing. And so anyway, he sets sail. He has four ships. He has 140 men with him. And he set sail in May of 1502, and his goal was to go as far west as possible to find China and, uh, you know, if possible, attempt a circumnavigation. So he's just going to go for broke and go west. And with his usual ease, he makes another smooth crossing, gets out of the Caribbean. But the problem is that it's hurricane season when he arrives. Now, he didn't know that. They didn't know about hurricane season. But Columbus had an uncanny ability for predicting the weather based on the ocean conditions. And when he got to the Caribbean, he could sense that something wasn't right. Columbus felt that there was a big storm coming, and he had been ordered to stay away from the colony, uh, from the king and queen, due to his many enemies there. But, you know, with this threat from the weather, there were problems with one of the ships. He needed to send back some letters to Spain. So he decided, you know what, I'm going to go to the the, the port at Santo Domingo uh, in the colony, even though I, I'm not supposed to go there. Well, when he arrives there, the newly appointed governor, that new governor, the, the king and queen appointed, Ovando, he refused to let Columbus stay in the port. Governor Ovando likely felt that Columbus was a threat to his power uh, because Columbus still technically was 
supposed to be the governor of the islands. Now, Columbus found that Ovando also was sending out 20 ships soon. He was going to be sending them out to Spain. And on board were these ships were actually, he was sending back uh, Roldan and Bobadilla, who were, you know, Columbus's former enemies. And Columbus warned them all, like, there's a storm coming, you guys. Like, I can sense it. Like, don't leave. But they all kind of laughed him off and mocked him as this kind of crazy old mystic, and they set sail anyway. Well, well, Columbus knew he couldn't delay any longer. He knew that this storm was coming, and so he began to look for a protected bay. And upon finding one, his ships, you know, they go into this bay, they drop all the anchors they can, and they're going to hold on for the storm. Now, meanwhile, the 20 ships who had just days earlier were laughing at Columbus and mocking him, all of a sudden, uh, you know, they become concerned as they see dark clouds on the horizon. And that concern likely turned to absolute terror as the storm hit. But it was too late. Um, all 20 of those ships were torn apart by the hurricane's wind and waves, and all aboard were drowned. Um, and in fact, this this massive loss of life, uh, those ships, the gold that they had, to this day is one of Spain's largest maritime disasters. Now, Columbus ships, they were in this protected bay, and they were barely holding on as the storm was just hammering them. The anchors were being pushed to their limits, um, and eventually all but one of them were torn from their anchorages. They actually, the anchors could not hold. And, you know, this happens in the middle of the night and they get pulled out into a raging storm in the ocean at night. I mean, I can't imagine the horror that night in a hurricane trying to keep your ships afloat. But Columbus was, you know, frankly a badass. <laughs> and and he did it. He kept his ship afloat, but he thought all the others are lost. You know what I mean? Like, there's no way they survived the storm. But as the morning came... And the storm calmed to his amazement, he saw a set of sails on the horizon. And then he saw another and he realized that the other two ships who were swept out to sea, including the one that had his brother on it, Bartholomew, who he's so close to, they had survived. And so anyway, they, none of his ships had been lost. It was, they felt it was a miracle and, you know, they rejoice and they end up taking a little while to repair their ships in the beautiful kind of tropical calm after the storm and they get their ships ready to go again. And, you know, Columbus at this point is like, all right, well, well, let's keep going. Let's, let's get on with the mission. So Columbus's small fleet sets out sail once more and they, they begin to go west and they press into unexplored waters, uh, across the Caribbean, um, heading west until eventually they hit the Central American mainland. They actually make landfall on the northeast coast of what is today uh, Guatemala. I'm sorry, not Guatemala, Honduras. And when they get there, they they, they kind of, you know, Columbus is excited because he noticed some of the natives they run into seem more advanced. But what he didn't actually realize is he was actually encountering some of the last remnants of, of the Mayan culture. But uh, he kind of felt like this was a good sign. These people are more advanced. It must mean we're getting closer to the Asian mainland. And as they go down the coast uh, of Central America, they kind of head south down along, you know, trying to find a westward passage. So they're trying to go through, but they didn't realize like there is no way through. Like Central America connects to South America and there's no way through. So we basically sail south along the coast of um, uh, Central America through places like uh, Honduras, uh, Costa Rica, down to Panama. And they have a combination of, you know, Good interaction with natives. They have some hostile encounters with natives. It's kind of a mixed bag. Um, and the other issue they're running into, though, is that this is late summer and it's the rainy season in the Caribbean. And the ships were just constantly battling crappy weather, little storms, miserable conditions. After weeks and weeks of this, they, they just push further and further south, um, trying to find a way around because they're thinking, okay, this is, this may be the Asian mainland. And so they're thinking if we continue to go south, we'll find a way around it and we can continue to go. Um, and anyway, so they're doing this. And there's an interesting anecdote that comes out of this. It's actually kind of a terrible story, but it, it's interesting nonetheless. One day when they pull into one of these bays, um, Columbus sends some gifts out to the natives to you know show, hey, we're, we're here in peace. And they come back and they actually give him as a gift two young girls one about eight and one about 14 is kind of a sexual gift. Well, Columbus is like, what the freak? <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't want to piss off the natives. So he brought them on board and he clothed them. He gave them gifts. He fed them and then, you know, promptly returned them back. And the natives were kind of like, Oh, that was nice. Like you didn't 
rape them or have sex with them. And so, you know, they were, they were impressed by that. But anyway, that was kind of an interesting story as they were going through this area. So, um, anyway, they, they press further south and they eventually get to what is today Panama. Now, as they were going further south, if you look at a map, it goes from south to like, then they start heading east and he's like, we're going east. Like Columbus is starting to realize like how, like I wanted to go west and the land won't let us. And so he starts to kind of worry that, you know, maybe they're, they're not going to be able to find a way around this. Like, and, and by this point, it may have become clear that he, he, he might've started thinking I haven't reached the Asian mainland. Um, but, but we don't know exactly, but it, it's, he wanted to, to find Asia. That was what he was looking for. So anyway, they get into this area in Panama and weather's still a problem. Um, they don't think they're going to be able to find, uh, you know, get around the world or make it to Asia. But they did find an area down there um, called Veragua that had a particularly promising outlook for gold. So Columbus decides to set up a, a gold mining outpost there. He says, let's do that. And then we'll return to Spain. But he wasn't able to find a good protected bay. So he found this large river mouth um, and they sailed into it, kind of this narrow entrance to this river mouth and uh, and dropped anchor there. However, after getting into the river mouth, they realized that they had sailed in on a day when the rains had created a deep channel, like the river was really raging that day. And the next day when they were in there, all of a sudden they realized their ships were trapped inside because the water had level had dropped in the river and now they couldn't get back out over the sandbar. And so anyway, so they're like, ah, crap. But they, they figured, you know what? The rain will come again and you know we'll be able to get the boats out. But in the meantime, they're like, well, let's go about setting up this, this settlement, which they called Belen, which is actually Spanish for Bethlehem, uh, that would act as their you know base of operations for collecting gold from that region. And the natives were initially friendly toward Columbus and his crew, uh, but that changed when they started to realize that the Spaniards weren't just temporary visitors, but that they were intent on setting up a permanent settlement on their land. And so the natives began to plot an attack to drive out the Spaniards. Now, Columbus and his men had got word of this plot. And in response, they devised a plan to capture the chief and his family and hold them hostage to deter the attack and negotiate. Columbus and his men end up tricking the chief into believing that they were coming on with, you know, some medicine to help him treat an arrow wound that he was suffering from. And so once they're inside, they pull their weapons and they take the chief and his household out as hostages. Now, they start heading back to the ship, but while en route, the chief was cunning and he was able to convince one of the guards to loosen up the restraints that he had on. And he was actually able to escape. And so he escapes, he goes back to his village and he gets his warriors and they attack. Columbus and his men kind of figured they were going to attack, so they were ready, and they were able to fight off this this attack by the natives. Um, and, and after they had done that, they, they felt, okay, well, we've beaten back the natives, you know, they shouldn't be too much more trouble. Plus, they they kept the members of, of the king's family as sort of a bargaining chip, you know what I mean? Kind of holding them hostage is like, don't attack us, and we'll, we'll treat them well, you know, but leave us alone. And Columbus makes preparation uh, to take his three ships back to Spain. And his plan was to leave his brother Bartholomew and one of the ships behind at the new settlement um, while he went back to Spain. Um, and to Columbus's delight, it began to rain uh, really heavily and about this time, and it cleared the channel out enough for them to get these three ships out. So they sailed out and they drop anchor while the final preparations are being made. There's three ships sitting out at anchor and there's this one in on the, on the land or uh, in the river mouth. And uh, while these three ships that are out at anchor, which have on them the the king's uh, family members, they sadly, um, they try and make an escape one night. And, and this is a real tragedy because some of them were able to escape, but those who were not were, were put back down below decks. And in the morning, uh, when they went to, to check on them, they found that they had actually all committed suicide. They had hung themselves using the ropes that were below decks. So now Columbus, uh, you know, this tragedy happens and he now thinks, you know, I don't have any way of deterring the king from attacking us because they all committed suicide. And, and so with three ships that were left at anchor and one remaining in the river mouth, the natives attack again. And this time the Spanish weren't quite prepared for it. And they kill several of the Spaniards who are in a lifeboat on the river. And the Spaniards suddenly realize that they're not going to be able to fend off the native attack. They, they, 
you know, desperately tried to get the fourth ship out to the other ships that were at anchor just outside of the river mouth, but they couldn't because it was too shallow. And they decide we, you know, let's just abandon the ship and the settlement. And they narrowly escape uh, and make it to the three remaining ships out at anchor just off the coast with all, you know, angry natives clamoring on the shore as they, as they make their retreat. So they barely escape. Now they, so with the abandonment of this attempted settlement in Panama, what is today modern Panama, um, Columbus and his men wanted to get back to Spain, but while they were in that river mouth, um, or, or maybe even earlier, it's not totally sure. There was a particular type of worm infestation that began to eat holes in their ships. And one of the problems was the man with the skill set for fixing and patching these kind of holes had been killed by the natives when they had attacked. And so, um, the holes on one of these ships as they were sailing back was so bad that they just had to abandon it. Um, so he was down now to only two really crowded ships trying to make it back to Spain and they were in really bad shape. They, these holes, you know, had been eaten in them and they were, um, and and they were essentially sinking and they were trying every day to bail out the water and to keep them going. And he knew he couldn't get back to Spain with the ships leaking so badly. And so he, he decided he was going to try and go about almost a thousand nautical miles back to the, the, the colony at uh, Hispaniola at Santo Domingo, uh, which is on the modern day Dominican Republic. So he's basically sailing from Panama to the Dominican Republic. And uh, when he got there, he was hoping he could either get new ships or repair the ones that he had, uh, if they could make it there. But in desperation, they, you know, were forced to run the ships aground before they got there. They had to run them aground on the Island of Jamaica, uh, in order to keep them from sinking. And just like that, um, in the summer of 1503, Columbus and his crew of 116 men were marooned on the Island of Jamaica. They, ran their ships aground at a place called St. Anne's Bay. Um, at least that's what it's called today on Northern Jamaica. And their first order of business was to make the grounded ships into these makeshift forts and shelter. Uh, Columbus was really worried about keeping order in this desperate circumstance. Uh, and he was worried about his 116 men going out and pissing off the natives. Uh, this time, you know, they couldn't just get on their ships and run away if the natives decided to get really pissed. So Columbus gave strict orders to his men to keep them on the grounded ships as much as possible. And they resented this, uh, you know, a lot. Um, Columbus knew that they had to try and get someone to the Spanish colony, uh, to get them help. Uh, the problem was that the nearest Spaniards were on the island of Hispaniola, which was 125 miles across open ocean from Jamaica. And even after landing there, it would be almost 300 miles across that island to the town of Santo Domingo. Now, Columbus was able to barter with some local natives to get a native canoe. He was able to give them some things and get a canoe or two. But he needed to find someone who he could trust to make an attempt at getting help and taking this native canoe 125 miles across the open ocean. Luckily, Columbus had developed a friendship and trust in a crewmate named Diego Mendez. He had proven himself loyal and brave on multiple occasions during the voyage and, uh, you know, especially during the attacks that they had recently fled. He had shown himself to be very brave. So Columbus tasked Diego Mendez with uh, taking a companion and some natives in this canoe and making the dangerous attempt at crossing 125 miles of open oceans to get to the island of Hispaniola to get help. And, you know, they'd have to cross 125 miles of ocean and then almost 300 miles of, you know, jungle infested land to get help. So it was quite a, a task he was asking him to do, but there wasn't much uh, other alternative. So Diego accepts the challenge and soon they bid farewell and his small crew set off in the canoe and the canoe disappears over the horizon and Columbus and you know his maroon crew basically are just praying for their success because their lives were really in the hand of Diego Mendez who, who, who had taken off. Now, while Diego sails off, Columbus and his men begin waiting for months and months and months, and they begin to lose faith that rescue is coming. A group of mutineers end up rising up because they felt that Columbus wasn't doing enough to get them off the island. So they rebel against Columbus, they steal native canoes, and uh, you know they weren't going to wait any longer for someone to come and help them. They were going to take it in their own hands. But these guys were not good seamen, and... Uh, 
ultimately they failed to make the crossing after multiple attempts and they did some terrible things to the natives like throwing them overboard uh when their ships were starting to when the canoes were starting to sink and they killed some and anyway, it, was, it was a bad deal um and so they made multiple attempts to cross they couldn't do it and eventually they come back kind of with their tails between their legs to columbus and ask forgiveness uh, columbus granted them forgiveness because he he knew that you know these guys are desperate and he didn't want to punish them for for that so eventually after many months, their food was also beginning to run low. And they also were running out of things on the ships to trade with the natives. And the natives were, uh, according to the records, they were beginning to get a little more stingy and they wouldn't be quite as liberal with what they were giving to the to, to Columbus and his men. Now, Columbus was desperate. He didn't want to see his son who was with him, who at that time I believe was probably 14 or 15, um, and his brother and his men starved to death. And so he devises this plan to get the natives to bring him more food. So Columbus had a book with him that charted the astronomic uh, patterns uh, in the sky. So he knew the exact day that there was going to be an eclipse of the moon that was coming. And so Columbus calls all the natives together and he tells them that the gods were not pleased. He said that unless they brought food on a regular basis to the Spanish, uh, the gods would be angry. And as a sign of their anger, the moon would go dark. And the natives kind of laughed at this, at least some of them did, and were kind of like, oh, okay. <laughs> and then literally right at that moment, the moon begins to change colors and turn black and they go nuts. They start panicking, going, oh no. And they beg Columbus for forgiveness. And he says to him, all right, well, I'll restore the moon if you guys promise to bring regular offerings of food. And they say, okay, we'll do it. We'll bring you food. Just bring back the moon. And then, you know, the eclipse starts to end and the moonlight begins to return. And, you know, it says that basically from that point forward, the Spaniards didn't have any problem getting food from the natives. And so anyway, they, they, they finally have food, but they're still waiting for this rescue. And uh, after almost a year of waiting, hope was beginning to be uh, lost. And then without warning, sales appeared on the horizon and everyone is excited. They think, you know, Diego's been successful. It's all over. They're going to be rescued. But it was actually someone that was sent by Governor Ovando. Ovando had got word of Columbus's plight and he had sent a ship basically just to check on Columbus's condition, not to rescue them. Ovando wanted Columbus to die because that would solidify his title as the governor and, you know, remove any challenge from Columbus to be the governor. So one can only imagine how terrible it was for Columbus and his men when the ship did not rescue them, but instead merely expressed sympathy and said they didn't have room for them. And almost as an insult, they left them with a single cask of wine and some bacon, and then they left. Um, now, Columbus kind of pretended otherwise. He was like, well, you know, I'm sure they're going to go back and get us more help. But it seemed pretty clear to Columbus that they weren't going to be getting help from Ovando. And now his men were becoming disillusioned. Uh, now, what Columbus and his men didn't realize was what had happened with Diego Mendez. Remarkably, Mendez had made the 125-mile open ocean crossing in the canoe, and he landed on the southwest end of what is now modern Haiti. Soon after he landed, he got word from the Spanish uh, uh, from the natives that there were Spaniards nearby, and. He was excited. He's like, yes, good. Let's go find the Spaniards. He goes and finds them and they take him to Governor Ovando. After hearing his story that Columbus and his men are, removed, are, are marooned, Ovando essentially detained Mendez for seven months. Uh, and likely this was because he was hoping that that would be enough time for Columbus and his men to starve to death on Jamaica and thus remove any threat of Columbus taking over as governor. Still, after Mendez got out. He didn't give up. He actually went out and he found some ships that were not directly under the control of Ovando, and he was able to charter two of them. And one of them he took back to Spain and he sent the other to rescue Columbus and his men. However, while that was all going on in Jamaica, things were looking really bleak. They, you know, began to lose faith that any rescue was coming, and a new group of men under the Poor Ass Brothers uh, decided to lead a mutiny against Columbus. And Again, they felt that there was not, they weren't doing enough to escape. They were sitting around waiting and they shouldn't be doing that. And it, it ends up turning into a full bloody fight. Several people are killed, uh, but the rebels end up surrendering and 
Columbus, he, he recognized the desperation of his men and he pardons all of them except for the ringleaders. Uh, and peace was again restored. And then soon after that, sails again appear on the horizon. And it was the ship that was sent by Diego Mendez. And they were all finally rescued uh, after being stuck on the island for an entire year. So after they were rescued from Jamaica, Columbus and his men stop off in the colony in Santo Domingo. And Governor Ovando pretends to be happy to see Columbus. Um, but he wasn't. And in an act of spite, he actually uses his authority to forgive the ringleaders of the mutiny that Columbus was planning on still prosecuting. Still, Columbus was grateful to be alive, and most of his crew decided that they wanted to head back to Spain as soon as possible. Columbus especially wanted to get back to you know, the king and queen and report about his new discoveries uh, along the east coast of Central America. And so he departs and he returns back to Spain after his fourth voyage. He gets there, but by this time, a hard life at sea was beginning to finally catch up to him and take a serious toll on his health. He was old at this point. He was beaten up, and to make matters worse, the queen was on her deathbed. And once she passed away, Columbus realized that the person who facilitated his work and vision was gone, and so too was basically any chance at future exploration. He realized that he didn't really have a chance at more exploration, and so he turned his attention to trying to at least salvage the money and titles offered to his family and to his men. In fact, in the last years of his life, there are all sorts of letters from him writing to the king and others asking for his men to be prayed properly, uh, according to the agreements that were made with the crown. Several of his men were actually, from that last voyage, from the fourth voyage, were penniless, and they were living on his charity. Uh, Columbus, Columbus by no means was poor. People say he died, you know, a pauper. Like, that's not true. He wasn't poor, but he certainly was not getting what he had been promised to him. And as his health began to finally fail, uh, he began to focus his efforts on ensuring that his sons would be taken care of. Um, and luckily his son, Diego, uh, one of his sons had found a high position in the royal court and actually eventually became, uh, uh, later became the governor. But Columbus worked hard and they were able to get some measure of the titles and privileges restored that could be passed on to his heirs, but but not really. And uh, ultimately, Columbus passed away on May 20th, 1506, and his final words were the same words actually of Jesus uh, in the Bible that were recorded that when he said, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And that's it. That is the story of Christopher Columbus, as I came to understand it through the biographies that I read. Now, it's very hard to summarize the life of Christopher Columbus. Columbus was first and foremost a deep believer in a particular religious worldview, and he combined that worldview with his passion for the sea into this epic narrative in which he was going to save the world. For him, these voyages were not only the product of nearly a decade of pleading and pitching to this uninterested aristocracy, uh, nor was it something... No, or I guess, nor was it only something that he had staked his life, his personal reputation and fortune on. Instead, for Columbus, these voyages were endowed with sort of a cosmic significance that connected him not only to the salvation of his soul, but they were also connected to the salvation of humanity itself. It's actually one of the great ironies of history that Columbus ultimately was and is one of the most important historical figures in world history but not for almost any of the reasons that he thought he was going to be. His vision was simply mistaken. However, the fact that he was a man of such ambition and vision was the reason that he was able to sail over horizon after horizon, despite all these obstacles that we talked about uh, in, in this podcast. He was not a genocidal, gold-driven maniac who led to the genocide and enslavements of millions of people. Uh, that's just not the way to frame his story. The story is far more interesting as we've we've kind of gone over. He was not just a conquering, greedy jerk invading a virgin land filled with innocent, you know, noble natives that were living at peace with nature and one another, and everything was great, you know. And I hope that that's that's clear if you do any research on it. Um, but you know, we have a holiday in the United States, Columbus Day, and. What is a modern American to make of Christopher Columbus? You know, he wasn't an American. He never even set foot in the United States. Why the heck do we have a holiday to this guy? Now, there are a lot of, you know, important historical figures with incredible stories, and they don't have holidays in the United States. So, so, so why him? Well, 
I would like to argue that Columbus can and should serve in many ways as an icon of Western civilization and of values that Americans can and should respect. So let's go through some of these values and kind of what he's an icon of. First and foremost, he's an icon of exploration. Columbus certainly should be appreciated as one of, if not the greatest icon of exploration. People who are willing to go over the horizon and into the unknown are to be admired because they are the ones who push the boundaries of human knowledge and achievement. I think kind of inherent in the American spirit is the spirit of exploration. You know, it was America that went first to the moon. It was America. That's, it is America that's going to Mars. It's, you know, it was Americans that press west into the wilderness in search of progress and a better life. The American tradition of going past horizons surely should be considered part of our American character. And Americans can look to Columbus as a type of icon of that westward, you know, voyaging spirit. He also was an icon of big dreams. Now, Columbus did not live in an age where anyone could be whatever they wanted to be. In the feudal world, there were serfs, lords, clergy, and classes. Columbus existed in a time when the darkness of the Dark Ages was just beginning to show a glimmer of light. And basically, he took advantage of that. Uh, it, it's kind of an echo of so many American stories. Columbus, the middle class person with big dreams. Dreams of not only transforming the world, but of saving it. And he wasn't just a dreamer. He, he had that entrepreneurial spirit. You know, he spent almost a decade of his life trying to sell this idea to investors who all laughed him off. Uh, and then finally, you know, he gets these three, you know, mediocre boats financed by an eccentric queen and his crew are on the verge of mutiny and then they sight land. And a whole new age begins because of this. You know, it, it, iconic to our American identity is this idea of the underdog beating the odds and the possibility of a single person being able to change the world. This idea of nearly limitless individual potential, which is really central to the American identity, sprouted and grew in the age of the new world as never before. And Columbus is iconic kind of of that story and that change to where big dreams could be accomplished. He, he also is an icon of religious faith. Okay. Columbus was a devoutly religious man. In fact, sometime during his third voyage and for the rest of his life, he wore the robes of a Franciscan friar. And, and it's actually believed uh, that he may have become a lay brother in that, in that order. Now, any study of his actual writings demonstrates his motivations and vision were all based in this religious worldview. Columbus viewed his life and history as the unfolding of a great cosmic drama. Now, America, since its founding, has also seen itself in a religious light as part of a bigger cosmic picture. Fundamental to kind of the American identity is this idea of in God we trust. And it is totally clear that Columbus placed all his faith and trust in his God. Now, we may quibble about his particular theological ideas. And in fact, I think that his story uh, is, is very instructive in helping us to avoid religious excesses. However, placing one's faith in God and oneself in a narrative of cosmic significance runs right to the very beginning of the American identity, and it seems appropriate that the first person to cross that great ocean and go west did so for religious reasons, just like so many after him did. He also is an icon of Western civilization. Americans are not and should not be cultural relativists. Cultures who engage in the sacrifice of children, cannibalism, sex slavery are in need of reform. And, to be sure, feudal Europe certainly was in need of reform uh, at the time of Columbus. Also, Columbus almost always, high, almost always spoke highly of the natives. You know, he wasn't someone who just went in and thought that they were all a bunch of savage barbarians. Um, however, the reality was that Western civilization at his time was far more advanced in terms of technology, human rights, law, architecture, music, religion, etc., etc. Columbus' vision was to convert natives and to bring them into civilized Spanish society and to make them fellow servants of the crown and Christians who were dedicated to God and thus could have their souls saved. His vision of bringing civilization to this feral people is much the same as the way Americans envision bringing democracy to places like Iraq. Sadly, you know, Americans and Columbus have learned that that is easier said than done. 
However, the desire to spread your values to the world is not in and of itself wrong. And ultimately, Western civilization did advance immensely in the centuries after Columbus, and it did so precisely in and because of the lands that he discovered. It certainly was a bumpy road, but all these things can't be blamed on Columbus. Columbus himself, like the man Columbus, wanted to bring less advanced peoples into a higher, more advanced way of living. And this motivation is not inherently immoral, and certainly Americans want to spread their values to the world. However, as I already mentioned, his story is also extremely instructive for all of us about the complexities involved with doing that. Now, another thing that a lot of people don't realize, he's actually an icon of ethical advancement, which a lot of people are like, wait, what? I thought he's this genocidal maniac. So Columbus should be admired from a humanitarian standpoint as a symbol of the kind of new ethic that was emerging in the West. It may seem strange to some who don't understand his history uh, and, and simply compare Columbus against their own standards of their day. The conquest of new lands by feudal kingdoms like Spain was totally new. And it was nothing new in the New World. The native chieftains had been enslaving and colonizing and subjugating one another long before Columbus and the Europeans had showed up. But what Isabella and Columbus kind of represented was this new and unique culture that was emerging in the West. Instead of holding to sort of the time-honored ethic of simple conquest and subjugation by force, Columbus and Queen Isabella were highly concerned with the religious conversion of the natives and the idea that they were to be integrated into her benevolent kingdom as Christian vassals rather than as conquered slaves. I mean, it's interesting that the people who actually fought against Columbus were enslaved, but even those who had been literally fighting to kill him and his men, he wanted to reform so that they could be brought into Christian civilization. He didn't just want to enslave them and punish them forever, which is, again, a very unique thing. There's not many people in history who took the peop very people who were trying to kill them and then just simply wanted to reform them and then make them into their brother. That, that was a new ethic that was emerging in Western civilization due to the influence of Christianity. Now, the story is ultimately one of tragedy of what happened to the native peoples. There's no doubt about that. But that was in spite of, rather than because of, Columbus. Sadly, the conquest ethic of Spain was too deeply ingrained in Spaniard society. You know, Spain at that time was a warlike society. They were on the tail end of nearly 800 years of near-continuous warfare with the Muslims. Ultimately, this new emerging, though still very imperfect, human rights ethic of the Christians like Isabella, Las Casas, and Columbus, it was overtaken by the greed of the conquistadors, and the rank brutality just couldn't be held back. As we do with people like Washington, who was involved in slavery himself, the balance of Columbus's deeds and vision, when fully understood, show him as a glimmer of light a glimmer of this new ethic around universal human rights that was imperfect, but it was budding and growing in Europe. Americans can celebrate that these initial glimmers of ethical light found in people like Columbus during an age when that was very rare eventually flowered into the idea that all men are created equal. Now, in completing this two years of research into the Columbus story, I found uh, the words of the great author Washington Irving summing up my feelings well as it relates to Christopher Columbus. And so I'm just going to read this epitaph, essentially, uh, or epitaph of, of Christopher Columbus. He said, His conduct as a discoverer was characterized by the grandeur of his views and the magnanimity of his spirit. Instead of scouring the newfound countries like a grasping adventurer eager only for immediate gain, as was too generally the case with contemporary discoverers, he sought to ascertain their soils and productions, their rivers and harbors. He was desirous of colonizing and cultivating them, of conciliating and civilizing the natives, of building cities and introducing the useful arts, subjugating everything to the control of law, order, and religion, and thus of founding regular and prosperous empires. In this glorious plan, he was constantly defeated by the dissolute rabble which he was doomed to command, with whom all law was tyranny and order restraint. 
They interrupted all useful works by their seditions, provoked the peaceful Indians to hostility, and after they had thus pulled misery and warfare upon their own heads and overwhelmed Columbus with the ruins of the edifice he was building, they charged him with being the cause of the confusion. Well, it would have been for Spain had her discoverers who followed in the track of Columbus possessed his sound policy and liberal views. What dark pages would have been spared in her colonial history? The new world in such case would have been settled by peaceful colonists and civilized by enlightened legislators instead of being overrun by desperate adventurers and desolated by avaricious conquerors. In his letters and journals, instead of detailing circumstances with the technical precision of a mere voyager, he notices the beauties of nature with the enthusiasm of a poet or a painter. When surrounded and overwhelmed by the ingratitude and violence of worthless men, he often, in the retirement of his cabin, gave way to gushes of sorrow and relieved his overladen heart with sighs and groans. When he returned to cha in chains in Spain, or to Spain, and came into the presence of Isabella, instead of continuing the lofty pride with which he had hitherto sustained his injuries, he was touched with grief and tenderness at her sympathy, and burst forth into sobs and tears. He was devoutly pious, religious mingled with the whole course of his thoughts and actions, and shines forth in all his most private and unstudied writings. Whenever he made any great discovery, he celebrated it by solemn thanks to God. The voice of prayer and the melody of praise rose from his ships when they first beheld the new world, and his first action on landing was to prostrate himself upon the earth and render up thanksgivings. To his intellectual vision, it was given to read the signs of the times, and in the conjectures and reveries of past ages, the indications of an unknown world. As soothsayers were said to read predictions in the stars and to foretell events from the visions of the night. His soul, observes one Spanish writer, was superior to the age in which he lived. For him was reserved the great enterprise to plow a sea which had given rise to so many fables and to decipher the mystery of his time. So do you enjoy the content here on Thoughtful Faith? If so, be sure to hit the notification bell. This ensures that our new videos show up on your feed. Also, be sure to check out our Facebook group called Thoughtful Saints, where myself and others discuss the sorts of topics found on this channel. And lastly, if you think other people would benefit from this video, please be sure to share it.